Hi, this is Steve Platek for Evolution, This View of Life, the magazine that approaches anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective. Today I'm talking with Professor Daniel Nettle, who's a professor of behavioral science at Newcastle University in the UK. Hi, Daniel. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Nice to speak to you. Yeah, excellent. Um, Daniel, I've been asking the people that I've been interviewing how they became interested in uh, studying from an evolutionary perspective. Well, yeah, that's interesting you should say that because I think everyone's got an aha moment, you know, so at some point in their life. So for me, I, I was a psychology undergrad and I kind of quite enjoyed my degree, but it didn't light up the world for me, you know, until I got to the final year and I took a course in animal behavior. And um, I took it with Marion Dawkins, who's maybe not as well known as she should be, but a really important figure in animal behavior. And um, suddenly I started always re reading all this stuff about, you know, not just like, uh, you know, are there differences between the sexes which we study in psychology, but um, why are there two sexes at all? And, you know, what about other species that have five or one and stuff like that? Now, this just blew my mind. I thought, yeah, this is fantastic. And I guess the, but the, main, the more serious point is that all those disparate topics I studied in my psychology degree now seem to be linked with an underlying thread. The underlying thread was that, you know, the point of the mind is to deliver behavior which is adaptive. And... Um, once you start seeing things in that light, of course, nothing simple, but at least you've got a, a sort of a guiding light in, 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 the, you know, in the confusion of, of the world. And um, that sort of stuck with me ever since, really. Wow, that's, that's excellent. That, and we've been hearing that from a lot of the people that we interview, that there's been this, and you put it perfectly, an aha moment. Um, yeah. And, and uh, interestingly enough, it seems to happen in animal behavior class, where people start studying animals and then, wait a minute, <laughs> humans are animals, right? Yeah. right. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, so let's, let's I think it's because that helps us sort of peel away the layers, right? So with humans, we've got so many kind of layers and concerns about like meaning and and uh, uniqueness and consciousness and so on. And then you start thinking, well, actually, you know, if you think about what we do, if you think about our inner experience, humans are you know enormously different. But think about the stuff we do. You know, we get resources, we have social interactions. You know, we get old. <laughs> um, uh, we fall in love, all of the things, and you think, well, yeah, these things make a lot of sense, right? These are there's a sh big shared heritage there with our with our uh, animal relatives. So. Yeah, that and and you bring up some some interesting things. Uh, the other day on campus, we had a lecture about uh, the psychology of belief, and one of the lecturers was a biologist who. Uh, who was completely 180 degrees out of phase with the other lecturers who were talking about, you know, social psychology and, and religious beliefs and, and talks about belief as being an adaptive psychological mechanism and exactly what you're saying. Mm. Um, let, let's shift gears to some of the stuff that you've done. I want to talk sure. um, primarily about two of the research projects that, that you've recently done, one of which I saw you present on at the NEEPS conference, which is this neighborhood project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, um, so I, I'm lucky. I live in the middle of Newcastle, which is a, a, a great and very vibrant and diverse city. And actually, I'm, I, I, my studies in this kind of attic. So when I look out of my window, the whole uh, landscape of the city, you can't see it right now, but the whole landscape of the city <laughs> is, down, is down below there. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I, from, from an evolutionary perspective, of, often what we want to explain is why does the same animal or human behave in such different ways according to its environment, right? So, you know, an animal will be aggressive in one context and not in another, or a human living in a certain environment will be aggressive and living, growing up in a different environment would be, di would be different. And I've been studying this on, in different ways for years, but I never thought of applying it close to home, you know. And then I sort of increasingly thought, well, looking out my window, what's bizarre is within sight of, uh, you know, of where I am, within a few miles, there's places where your chance of getting murdered, by the way, it's thought is thankfully low wherever you are, isn't it? <laughs> Relatively speaking, your chance of getting murdered is like 20 times wow. if you go this way west versus this way north. And you think, well, that's crazy, right? We're the same culture, we're the same city, we're the, we're the same people with the same DNA, but the environment's very different, right? In the area where you're more likely to get uh, murdered and where the rate of violent crime is generally higher. It's an area that's undergone a lot of urban decay. People don't have jobs. Resources are scarce. People are kind of desperate and on edge versus a more affluent, settled area. And I started thinking, God, if we care about human behavior, that's incredible. Oh, I'm sorry, my phone's gone. Okay. <laughs> sorry about this. No problem. Hello, Daniel speaking. I'm sorry. Not, not at the moment. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> Did I start that answer again? 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so tell us about your neighborhood research. Okay, right. So my neighborhood research stems from the fact I live in the middle of Newcastle, this big and vibrant city. And like a lot of cities, it's very internally diverse. And actually, from where I live in the middle of the, the city, if you go a couple of miles in one direction, there's an area where your chance of being murdered or in a violent incident is over 10 times higher than if you go a couple of miles in the other direction. And, of course, they're the same people, the same broad cultural background. Uh, they belong in the same, you know, they're part of the same country with the same institutions. But yet, their behavior is so different. But actually, that's because the environment's pretty different, too. So, um, you know, over in the west end of the city over there, um, resources are scarce. Uh, you know, it's, it's an area of, of, of urban decay. Um, people don't have a lot of money. They're kind of on edge. And in the north, people are more affluent. You know, the environment's more orderly and predictable. And so, of course, they behave in very different ways, according to the ecology. And so I began to think, well, look, this is a great study system. Here I am, you know, I've been studying peoples on the other side of the world, but actually just walking out from my house, I've got a great study system right there. Right. And um, I read a lot of the stuff that David Sloan Wilson's been doing in Binghamton, and I thought, well, this is right. You know, we, we tend to, when we do cross or comparative studies, we tend to say, um, you know, we compare one ethnic group with another ethnic group on another continent, but there's also variation just comparing subgroups within... Um, you know, within a country or even within a city. So that kind of inspired it. And um, the nice thing about the field site being so close at hand, hand is I can develop many, many different methods. I can do questionnaires, I can go out and do observations, I can use data from the local police database to find out about, you know, crime, what crime happens and where. So you end up with a rich tapestry of different methods all kind of zeroing in on how life is different in different parts of the same city. Wow. So, so that's fascinating. And how does that relate to um, sort of animal environments? Do we see the same homologues in, in animal societies? Yeah, yes, I think we do. And I think that, um, you know, one of the sort of great, the great uh, discoveries of behavioral ecology in the 80s was, um, you know, I think, I think before that we tend to think of animals as having species-typical behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I think behavioral ecology made us think that actually what, what animals are is decision makers. And so maybe the decision-making mechanism is species-typical, but the inputs they're going to be getting from the environment are very different, and they respond to that in very subtle ways. So there were very clever, classic experiments in behavioral ecology where you just vary the food supply, and um, you know, animals' aggression or their foraging strategy or their risk sensitivity changes like, you know, pretty much as an immediate response to that. And I think that that's sort of what we're seeing here. Of course, we can't do true experiments. Right? I can't right, go right. to the neighborhood, sadly, and change the food supply, but what I can do is, a, in a correlational way, try and understand how the, the distribution of things in the environment might be affecting what people, people do. Could you elaborate, could you give us some examples of what some of those environmental factors are that are influencing the difference between saying being homicidal versus being not homicidal in a, in a, in a neighborhood? Yeah, well, so I haven't really studied homicide itself, but okay. it's one marker, right? I mean, obviously homicide's a rare event, but right, right. where you get low trust, um, you get low investment in the in the dictator game, which is a sort of indication that you don't want to you don't want to reach out and connect with the individuals around you, um, and you get um, you know high levels of violent crime and a low willingness to sort of inter to um, get involved in the behaviour of your neighbours. That goes with a high homicide rate. So all of these things kind of pattern together. Um, as for the environmental factors, we don't really. No, so I mean, my neighbourhood that's got more violence in it is, is a lot. People are a lot poorer, but I don't think that's really the critical thing. One thing I'm really interested in is the idea of voluntary assortment, right? So, human cooperation is generally sort of maintained by the fact that if we don't like the people we're with, we can move away. Mm -hmm. You know, we can go and find some other social partners, and that's a kind of mechanism to constantly ensure that that cooperators manage to assort with other cooperators to the exclusion of, of sort of social cheaters. But one of the neighborhoods I've been studying is um, most of the housing is local, is, um, is um, owned by the city, okay. and uh, there isn't a big demand to go there. So basically the people who sort of end up there are the people who haven't managed to use their economic power or their connections to go somewhere else. So you've okay. got a lot of people stuck together. Who don't, you know, they don't really feel very positive about the place they live, but they've got no walkaway option. And actually, theoretically, we think this should have quite a strong effect on cooperative behaviors, right? Because if you think, well, if I don't like the way these people are behaving, I've got the economic power to go and move into a different neighborhood and find norms I like, you're kind of stuck there. So how do you respond? Well, maybe you just sort of 
you know, hunker down, you try not to interfere with the people around you, you know, um, um, at all, but you don't go out of your way to interact with them either because you kind of don't trust them. And that leads to this kind of social atomism where individuals feel very disconnected. And I think things like crime can, can flourish under those conditions where people are not sort of looking out for each other, um, where you have what sociologists call low collective efficacy. Wow, that's fascinating. And, you know, as a neuroscientist, I immediately start to think about what the neurocarlets of, of the, or the, or the variable neurocarlets associated with people who are in this disconnected society versus in this more connected society. Um, and, and if there's something that might predispose or, or be developed as a consequence of that. Have you ever well, thought about that? I think that's, I think that's a, you know, a great idea. And it's probably both, right? Then there are predispositions, but I'm sure that the, you know, the environment has an impact. We know a lot about social neuroscience now, right? We know that if you're, you know, if you feel, um, you know, if you trust people, if you cooperate with people, there are there are processes and structures that are that are different. So um, my guess is, uh, and we also know that in these neighbourhoods, you get higher rates of anxiety disorders. Mm. Some suggestion you get higher rates of par higher rates of paranoid cognition. So those clinical neuroscientific things, you know, do differ um, um, by by sort of socioeconomic status and things like that. So. It makes perfect sense to me that, that the social experience you're having is going to, you know, is going to be embedded somehow in your in your brain. I mean, that, yeah. that seems quite especially accumulated over a lifetime. Sure. Yeah. Approximate neural mechanism in, in right. a sense, Absolutely. right? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. Let me ask you one more question about the neighborhood uh, project before we shift gears. Is there yeah. anything that can unite neighborhoods that would otherwise be seen as disparate? And and being in the UK and having lived in the UK, the one thing I think about is football. In other words, if you walk through one of these neighborhoods with a Newcastle jersey, um, yeah. you know, are you treated differently? Are you trusted? In other words, is there something that can bring people together? And in America, we oftentimes think about race because we yeah. have a, a, in our cities, like where I'm at now in Atlanta and where I grew up in Philadelphia, the, the multiracial content is, is outstanding. Um, yeah. But, but football is a huge thing in the UK and in Europe. Yeah. And, and is there, are there things that can bring the societies together, the groups together? Yeah, I think absolutely, um, absolutely there are, and I think that sports do serve that function. Other kinds of sort of coalitional markers serve that function. I mean, interestingly, the 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 neighbourhood that I've been particularly studying has undergone. I think it had those things historically, right? It was always a working class neighbourhood, but I think uh, it was a functional one that probably had those kinds of um, you know things binding the community together. What's happened really since the decline of the heavy industries, which the, these neighbourhoods grew up to to service, is um, it's actually that there's been a lot of population loss. So there's kind of, you know, in streets you'll have lots of empty lots and lots of empty houses. And I think that, that, that in a way the sort of shared markers have lost their meaning. As people have dispersed, you know, anyone can kind of get, who can get out does. A lot of those markers maybe have, have kind of lost their, their meaning a bit and there, there seem to be few opportunities for people to come together. So it would be very interesting to understand the difference between your classic kind of high solidarity working class neighborhood where people don't have much money but they have sort of strong social connections. The kind of places I'm studying seem to be where people don't have much money and also they feel their social connections are very atomized. So maybe, maybe it's that quadrant. I mean, I don't know exactly which determines which of those quadrants you go into that where you start to have serious uh, sort of social problems. Wow. It's often to do with change in the population, you know, people dispersing, population diminishing, you know, things like that. I think. Okay. Okay, that's fascinating. And, and as you talk about that in cooperation, um, I saw that you have a, a forthcoming article about sharing and giving. Yeah, um, yeah. Can you right. just tell us a little bit about that project? Yeah, well, it's probably the, the simplest evolution of cooperation model that's ever been done, really. I mean, it's just very, very simple. And basically, um, and this is not a completely novel idea, but we maybe take it in a new direction. What we're saying is, you know, why do humans share or why do they cooperate more generally? You can think about that, that there are... Um, there are benefits to group living. Let's think, think about the simplest example. As you and me, Steve, we're on, you know, we're in the savannah. Um, <laughs> if you go your way and I go mine, we both get picked off by a lion, right? Okay. But if we stay together, whatever we, we, we do, you know, if I can keep you near me, at least the lion might get you, or, you know, the, the predation risk might get diluted. So let's say I've got 3,000 calories worth of food. I'm going to eat the first 2,000 because it's going to keep me alive till tomorrow. <laughs> right. it, in fact, whether I eat the remaining 1,000 depends really, is, is the marginal benefit of another 1,000 calories on top of 2,000 to me more than the marginal benefit of making sure that you remain happy given that you're my buffer against the lions, right? Yeah. 
Like so I might well, quite rationally, and from a purely sort of selfish individualistic, or you know, in evolutionary terms, a sort of individual level selection pressure, I might actually try and make you eat the remaining thousand. Okay, mm. simply because mm. the marginal benefit just comes from you, from, from your uh, dilution of my predation. So what we play around with in this model is just um, different kinds of returns to consuming resources. Like quite often we, we look at diminishing returns where you get a lot out of the first 2,000 calories and less out of the next 2,000. Mm -hmm. And different payoffs from having a social partner around. And you, you soon come to the conclusion that there are, there are actually many equilibria where um, even from an individual level uh, you know, selection perspective, it's perfectly understandable that, that individuals might want to transfer their resources to others, right? Say, you know, those others might be providing care to your kids, they might be diluting your predation risk, as in my example. They might, in so many other ways, be providing you some sort of benefit. Um, this is what Bill Hamilton back in the day called neighbor modulated fitness, right? I can improve my fitness by investing in my neighbors, you know, to make sure they don't disperse, to make sure they're still alive, so that the stuff they're doing, uh, you know, rebounds back on me. Right. But this is quite, not quite the same as reciprocal altruism in Shriver's sense, right? So it's not like I'm giving you these resources because tomorrow you'll give them to me. It's like I'm giving you these resources because I'm more likely to survive the night with someone else around to, you know, to, to dilute my predation. So we just play around with that model, you know, in a really simple way and try and de derive some, some predictions you might be able to test. That's fascinating. Um, and my wife and I, Austin Krill, um, we've done some work on the neurocarlots of social exclusion. And, and what we find is that when you're excluded from a group, the yeah. same parts of the brain that are active when you're physically in pain are active when you're socially excluded. And others have replicated this. Um, yeah. And so it makes total sense that we'd have these proximate and ultimate mechanisms to keep so, us yeah. together in groups for our own benefit. Absolutely. So what you've got to think about is humans are a kind of obligate social forager, right? right. I mean, you, and so having no social partners is about the worst thing that can, can happen to you. <laughs> So, so much so that, I mean, I think a lot of these cooperation experiments where people share money or they share, you know, resources of some kind, what they really show is we're really averse to, you know, you set up even a minimal social encounter. People say, oh, I want to make sure everyone gets something. Right. Because what we're really averse to is everyone saying, God, that guy's horrible. You know, let's yeah. keep away from him. Exactly. So when you set up these kind of even quite minimal artificial scenarios, people adopt the heuristic, you know, I better share some of this with the others, right? I don't want to, you know, I, I want people to think I'm a good guy. And, um, you know, that's, that's obviously a very powerful human motivation. And I would say that just comes from a long history of social living and, and sort of obligate social foraging. And of course, there'll be neural mechanisms to, to underpin that. Yeah, that's fantastic. that's fantastic. We're running a little bit low on time, but I did okay. want to ask you one question. Um, on your webpage, I see a picture of you in scuba gear. Absolutely. Are you a scuba diver? I am a scuba diver, yes. That is fantastic. Where do you I scuba just dive? I've come back from the Great Barrier Reef, in fact. Wow, wow, <laughs> that is fascinating. Um, if we had time, I'd ask you more about that. But, Daniel, I have to say goodbye and thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank All you. All right, thanks. Bye.